Testing? Okay, that works. Okay, this, um, this next presentation is scheduled for 20 minutes. I think we're Martha, at the, in the 15, I'll give you a, a note card to, that you've got five yeah. minutes more. Uh, the presentation will be 20 minutes, and then after the presentation, there will be five minutes for a question and answer session. Then we'll take a five-minute break before the next talk. Uh, with that said, uh, our next speaker, Martha Hunt is talking about lessons learned about teaching in the making of a video game. Martha? Thank you, John. Uh, thanks for coming today. I'm going to touch on a couple things, but first of all, I wanted to ask a few questions. Number one is, how many of us went to traditional schools? You went through elementary versus homeschooling. Traditional? That's where I went. And that's where I sat and listened to the teacher. And I took tests, wrote papers. I did well enough to get into graduate school, but at the end of every semester, and maybe this is just me, I found doing that final project, I find taking that final test, especially finals, rather anticlimactic. And that got me to thinking recently, in the past few years, about what are you guys experiencing, the, the students in the room, with um, your classes? In CAP, it's a little bit different. You have projects and you're engaged in things in the community very often. In some classes, you're still taking tests and writing papers. All are valuable. There's no question about that. So I'm not one to say we need to quit teaching this way and just play video games to learn. But I do think we may be missing an opportunity if we don't explore how they can be used in the learning process. One of the terms thrown around these days is digital native and digital immigrant. I fall in the age group of that digital immigrant. Anybody under 25, 30, you're a digital native. You grew up with the technology. And I, I realized this when I was sitting there watching my nephews playing a video game, Mario, Super Mario, something or another. And I was fascinated by the fact they could navigate in a space. And so they tried to teach me, my seven-year-old nephew. And it didn't go well because I couldn't figure out how I could get from this point to that point. And he eventually grabbed it back and said, thanks, Aunt Martha, and took off and could win the game. And it hit me that he was learning in a space I had no knowledge of. And that's where I started to think about what, how can we take advantage of that technology. So today I'm going to talk about a couple things. One is the VBC immersion experience that I had a few years ago and how we might think about educational video games in this environment and what that might mean in the future of teaching in CAP and other places. Some of us have been to the VBC. Anybody know about the VBC here? A few of us know very well. There's the Virginia Ball Center for Creative Inquiry. It's one of the premier immersion experiences students can take part of, where you go over there for a semester. That's all you do, in theory. Most of the time, that's all you do for all of your credits. You don't get paid. But you do get to spend an entire semester in an interdisciplinary environment doing one project. And every year, there are two seminars going on in the fall and two in the spring in which you can ask to be a part of. You have to interview to be there. So that's what I'm going to talk about here and give you some background on what I was doing there. I proposed that the students in my seminar create a video game. And I had a few premises that I started with. One is, I'm very concerned about the natural environment. So I said, well, is there a way we can use video games to reconnect kids to that environment? The second, you know, and I already told you this, kids learn by playing video games. There's all kinds of data out there right now that, that would support that. In a video game, kids are into virtual worlds. And in CAP, we're always working with virtual worlds. And we are often working that way, either digitally or in an analog fashion where we're doing sketches and perspectives and that kind of thing. And of course, I speculated that we could connect people to nature through those games, and that there's potential for education in this arena. If you look at video game purchases, it's no surprise, really, but the number of units sold in 2005 and 2006, this is in millions, 228.3 million video game units are sold in one year in the U.S. 
and that continues to increase. The green at the top is only the computer games. So that's a huge market. The dollars associated with this course, I sat down and thought, wow, if we create a video game, maybe we can make some money. And that's in billions in the United States. That's a lot of money that's being put into this technology. Usually to make money, not to educate people. A very small percentage of the market is targeting the educational video game piece. All of you have played video games before? Most of you have. I'm not too good at them. This is how many people buy them each year in the United States right now. And there's still a gender difference. It's, it's changing a little bit. And it isn't just the adolescent male that's playing a shoot 'em up game anymore. And you'd be amazed at how many people 40 years and older are purchasing these things. But still, if you're under the age of 25, you grew up playing some form of a video game. It doesn't have to be 3D. It may have been 2D. But you um, did that. Just as a reminder, the Virginia Ball Center, um, there are certain requirements. For one thing, it's one semester, 10 to 15 students. Get almost all your credits there. Some did. Has to be interdisciplinary. And you have to have a community partner. In the end, you also have to have a product. All those pieces together usually result in an amazing semester, in a very successful semester. In my seminar, I had one person from TCOM, an English educator, computer science, biology and natural resources students, and some landscape architects. The breakdown in terms of the age group, two sophomores, four juniors, and six seniors. So you have a vertical difference as well in terms of their education. I charged them with creating a video game about saving the natural environment in one semester. If you know anything about me, you know I don't know how to make that. If you know anything about making a video game, and some of you probably have done this, the big ones that are out on the market, the fancy 3D things, you're talking at least $4 million in four years of many people working on it. Not only that, I told them it had to be educational and it had to be about Indiana's natural ecosystems. All that together set them up or I didn't tell them at the time, an almost impossible thing to do. And you're going to see in just a second here <laughs> the result of some of that. Now they had to do this by working interdisciplinary environment. They had to learn how to design and create games. If you know anything about games, they have to be fun. It's not good enough just to take a test and say, let's do a trivia game. That's, that's not fun. So they had to explore how that happens. Had to be out about Indiana's ecosystems and its elements, and they had to work with and for a target audience. If you think about it, very often in your projects in CAP, you have a target audience, you work with community people, you have very specific program elements, so it isn't that unlike what we already do. But in this case, there were big stakes, because at the end of the semester, they had to have a showcase to about 200 people, where they could not afford to fail. Mac, Mac. Yeah. This is a seven minute video. There must be a better way to teach to children about, about ecology than the conventional textbook method. Our target audience it, in the very literal sense is a second grade class, but it's more broadly applicable for elementary students in general. Our goal is education uh, in a fun way, and it has to be accessible enough that a second grader can pick it up and won't get bored with it. A lot of these games were a lesson in class that they're going to get in class, and they're coming to use these programs to get more interactive, like more experience with it. And so don't teach them, like don't give them a trivia game. Give them something that they can start to understand how everything works. Making a, a learning game, we, we want to address the real world, right? So maybe there's some play with those boundaries. Kids relate to Alice in Wonderland going down into the hole and that size shift. I really like the idea of being able to be an agent in the ecosystem. Like if you could actually be a part of it and watch how your actions affect other parts of it. 
As the Argus sends a shot of fairy dust swirling from his fingertips, the sparkling powder circles Morgan's head, causing him to sneeze. Achoo! Well, you better start believing, because we need your help. Now, will you help us? Yeah! What I found is that the kids are very excited about their story. The title was really exciting to them, because it's forbidden, so it's exciting. I think a very prevalent theme here is that the kids love the concept of danger. There was a suggestion that they needed to have chainsaws and hammers. So uh, they, brought, they brought the violence. We didn't even have to. <laughs> and what is most amazing to me is the fact they have a concept that is just great. They're making three games in one, looking at prairie, wetland, and forest. And that is going to cover the major ecosystems in East Central Indiana. Yeah, this is something that can be done. But it is quite complicated, which is the other thing that is very apparent. Because without a good story, without supporting graphics, code that works, character development, environmental issues coming forward, and reality there, you've just done another game. We have spent a lot of time figuring out all these character issues. Um, we had a fascinating discussion on gender. We've run into some disagreements. If we have, you can choose your gender, choose your name. Okay, maybe choose your name wouldn't be so, um, so much more work, but a different gender, then we have to develop another character right. and all those eight movements. Let's maybe be realistic here. Why waste our time on another character when we can spend more time on the mini games and developing well, that? Congratulations, it's a boy. What are you calling him? Well, I mean, who cares what the kid calls him? The kid wants to call it racial litter. Let him call it racial. Yeah. That was wonderful. We have all of that worked out to the side, and now we have this... Ah, issue of graphics. How do we create the graphics for this character in this game in a whole new medium called the pixel, which is completely different than anything any of us have dealt with before. It's using this tile system, which is just like tiles on a floor, same grid system, and it's 32 pixels by 32 pixels, and we have to figure out how do these fit together, how do we represent the right colors that look good from the right distance of the screen, and it's like one giant puzzle. Mm -hmm. And there too. Graphics has had our headaches, and we've had a few little tiffs. We've been having problems communicating with our storyboards. We're kind of at that point where we don't know what we're going to be able to get done to actually get it together. We have our hopes, our dreams. This is insane. OK, I'll just speak for myself. I'm wondering. I know it's going to get done, but I just wonder how. It's just it's crazy the amount of work that we have to do. There's only so many hours in the day, and I'm using about as many of them as I can. A couple more weeks of this, and I guess we'll have a video game to showcase. We can see the final project. The wetland games completed, and the forest games completed. The prairie game is almost playable, and it'll be completed in a few days. We're actually getting everything done, which is shocking and amazing. We spent so much time researching and finding these pictures, finding information about it, life cycles, sizes, and it's just really amazing seeing this now turn into like an artistic representation. I'm doing things I've never done before, I never thought I would do before. I never even knew I could do or that could be done. The games are kind of starting to become into a sort of restoration themed game where we are letting the child feel that they can make a difference in the environment. They are changing the route of a river, replanting a forest, things like that, kind of actually doing something in the environment. Somehow get that in front of people as you go because what you learn in each case will involve that game. The playtests went so well and the kids loved the game. They were so excited to get to play them. They just kept asking questions about it. It was really hard for us to even get them off the computers to get back into the discussion group. Gotcha. They had some really, really cool suggestions for the game. What if we could pick out and make our own person? So I'm just so, so excited and relieved. I am so pumped, and it's, it's about time things are.
I'm going to forego the rest of my wonderful PowerPoint I prepared and just talk about a few things because as John points out, I had about four minutes. If I were to, you know, the Virginia Ball Center has money. So everybody says to me, well, you had the best students, you had all the money. But you'd be amazed that, and I agree, we had the money to bring in the game expert to talk to them at the beginning of the semester to tell us how in the world to stop this free fall that we just had, I had launched on them to actually go through this process of design. So I'm a firm believer in CAP. If we want to do something that, that's really supported, support it. The other thing is, we all got to focus on that. We had enough time. These students didn't know each other, most of them, at the beginning of the semester, so they had to become cohesive as a group. And if you know anything about social capital, they need to kind of depend on each other and rely on each other and work out all those fights. You'd have no idea how angry the biologists still are at the landscape architects because we said it was okay to change the course of the river. They have very different paradigms they're working from. But because they came together in an interdisciplinary way and they were rewarded for it by working with kids, and I also guarantee you within two weeks, they didn't really care about the grade they were getting. They cared that those second graders would like that game. So I did a really good job of constructing something, and while they still kind of cared about my opinion, they made decisions I never would have made. And because they were working together, they did something that most game designers find almost impossible. And that is to get away from math blaster, where you just shoot at a balloon if you know what the right addition is and that kind of thing. And they created a a design of a game from the ground up that was dependent on the system. So if you're looking at creating a video game, you understand the system that you're designing for and use that as the base and move forward instead of another trivia game or something else. And I think if, I, if you look at those two things, you know, I, I could say to you and argue all day long that we, we should have all video games in the classroom. And I could say, you know, there are two ways to think about it. I could go create a video game, you play the game, and then you become a better landscape architect or architect or whatever that is. Or I could say, you'll learn a lot more if you create the game. Most of us probably aren't going to be creating those video games. That's not what we do. But I did find, aside from the fact it's an intriguing concept, each of those students found great meaning in that work. Not the same meaning I found in it, but they became so engaged because it was important to them. And if we can connect important work in our classrooms using digital technology that, frankly, they're more, far more fluent with than I am, then everybody wins. They learn a lot about working in groups, and they're much more well prepared to go out and practice in whatever fields they've chosen. So with that, I'll close this. and. Open up to questions if you have any. Nothing? Cindy? No. It's in prototype working form. I'm currently in conversation with a company in Indianapolis to take one of the games, make it a little bit better, the forest game, and put it up on the web so it's accessible to everybody. The, it takes a lot of time to do this. Of course, after the semester, my expertise left. And while we still get together for reunions, it's really hard to find the money and the time. I had to go and teach GIS again. Yes? How do I do? Until the software is advanced enough so you can kind of plug and play the pieces, you're not going to be able to say, we're no longer going to teach engineering. Let's make a game out of it. However, if someone has the time as an independent study, they'll know more about engineering than we do because you have to understand what's going on in the system in order to create something that's legitimate. Um, I, I know Joe Blaylock has had an independent study group that has done games before because they just wanted to. I would recommend you do 2D games, not 3D games, or anything about 3D visualization software will take you forever. Um, but it's, it's a ways off, I think. 
also I think it's a huge opening because again, most commercial places are looking to make a lot of money. Most educators make really bad games because they're entertained by the fact they can add it all up and it works. It doesn't make it fun. And that's what the students would just sit there and say, yeah, Martha, that's not fun. And so you kind of have to work with the audience and, and move that forward. You can do it with your, your projects. Become a game. Yes? Yeah, again, you, you, with Second Life, you have that commercial grade multi-user thing. And so I, I think that's an avenue that could, could work. Of course, this game, I chose a particular audience in part because I knew a second grader really wouldn't care that it wasn't 3D. And we didn't need that in our way as we went through the semester. But um, you know, some of the stuff Chris Marlowe is doing, if he turns that into a game, is a really good way for people to start to visualize what happens with the floods and that kind of thing. SimCity is a game that, that's fairly sophisticated, even though I'm not sure why a volcano is in the middle of the city. It, it does offer that simulation play for people to understand. I, I think we're a ways off from that. It's just we don't have the technical skills usually in this college. It's hard. What's that? Have those technical skills? I, I think the next generations will because it will become plug and play. And there's already software out there. I could do this game on my own from a technical standpoint. I'd like to think I'd be smart as those students and figure out how to do the game. But the reality is I, I'm not a computer scientist. I'm not a biologist. And they came to the table of those systems in a way I couldn't. It's a, it's a fun way for people to engage. And one of the things they say about a game, unlike me in teaching, if you ask me the same thing 20 times, I'm going to eventually snap and leave the room. But a game won't. So if you need to practice it again and again and again, you get that practice in there without frustrating the daylights out of somebody else because you, you're on a quest to win the game and people engage that way. So it has the infinite patience. Rob, do you have a question? or? Yeah, a simulation, a bit like SimCity. It could be, it'd have to be a little more sophisticated in order to do it, but certainly that would be if you could write the algorithms, that could happen. And, and the real-time simulation, I think, is what's important. And the problem with something like SimCity, there are predefined solutions. And you need to have enough flexibility in the solutions to, to provide that testing around it. Not that I like to use the word test. Thank you, Martha. Uh, it's now 25 after. We'll take a five-minute break, and then our final speaker of this session will start promptly at 2.30. Thank you.